Hello, my name is Jude Scott and today we're going to do a multicoloured wash that you will be able to learn from and use in backgrounds for your skies. Here I've mixed up uh, some blue, burnt sienna and uh, a raw sienna and I'm going to really load my brush up with strong pigment and water so that the first couple of strokes across the top of the paper are quite strong. And I'm going to put some more pigment into that. It's very rough paper and I've got some dry sort of little skips on the paper there that I don't want. When you go back over your paper, make sure that you cover the last stroke by about 50% with your brush and that way you won't get any hard lines appearing. Just overlap every stroke and now that I want to get a little bit lighter as I go down the paper, add water just to the tip of your brush. Don't pick up too much or you'll have too much water running down the paper. And now that's fading out really well, but I want it to get paler still, so I will just move that across the paper and then add just some clear water. So now I'm going to put in some um, raw sienna that I've mixed up. Um, it could be making a, a landscape or you could just be painting any background to paint over the top of. Um, it's quite strong paint so I'm putting a little bit more burnt sienna with that. And the flow of the paper down, the paint down the paper, sorry, will help those different changes of colour to merge together beautifully. I'm going to make it a little bit darker now by adding some of the blue into the burnt sienna and this could be used for a sky or an ocean or just a mass of land or you might just want a change of colour in an abstract that you're painting. So just keep overlapping those brush strokes and the paint will flow seamlessly down the paper for you. If it becomes stripy paint, you haven't used enough uh, water with your pigment. You shouldn't have stripes in your paper. But keep practicing until you can do a perfectly graded wash, even just using one color. And then you might decide to add some colors as you go along. Here I'm using um, Holbein Cobalt. I really love Holbein colors beautiful rich lustrous colors in watercolor and they're quite strong pigment but I'm adding water because I want those paints to merge together I don't want hard lines anywhere there so I keep adding a little bit of water to my brush and I'll get that to flow down the paper I've drawn up three very similar uh, landscapes and I've masked each one off with some magic tape so you can't see that but you can probably see the houses it's a little house or some buildings here and I'm cutting in around those with my tip of my paintbrush lift it off if you get too much just dry your brush well between each um, if you're mopping it out um, it's gone very light at the top because it was very wet and the wetter your pigment the lighter the paint will dry so I want this to be a really dark and moody sky. So I am going to add some more pigment to that paper, just dropping in some more cobalt. And because it's strong pigment, even though it's quite wet, it is merging beautifully with the paper. But I think I'd like that to go a little bit faster down the paper. I don't want it to dry out before it gets to the horizon line. Otherwise, what will happen is I'll get a hard line so if you pick your paper up on your board, you can tilt it any direction. You can get it to go sideways, you can get it to go back to the top of the sky, or if you've got a fierce wind blowing and you want the look of rain clouds scooting across the sky, you can hold it on an angle and gravity will make that paint move down the paper for you. And it will move the pigment beautifully and you get some magic effects how these paints merge together and it's just water and gravity and all of that paint on the paper is still quite wet. 
So now I might, I'll try lifting out a cloud. Um, I don't think it's going to work that well, but I'll have a go. If it doesn't work, I'll just add more paint over the top. So that is one way you can lift out a cloud. So you use the whole of your brush. You've got um, the tips of the brush you can use to get wispy cloud effects happening or you can use the flat of the brush, almost horizontal to the paper. I'm just not happy with that cloud so I'm going to drop even more pigment in over the top of that. And you can see that the paper is still shiny wet. So that will still merge together and flow down the paper. You won't get any hard lines suddenly happening. And what we're after with clouds and <clears throat> different skies is mostly soft edges. Not many clouds have very hard edges. So just keep it quite wet and flowing. Just spray a little bit more water with a mister spray <clears throat> just to get encourage that just to flow a little bit more. You can pick up your taped paper and still you can turn it any way you like to get those the water and the pigment to flow on the paper. When it's stopped flowing, then you can lay your paper horizontal. It is now that it's dried and I'm going to home in with the camera so that you can see what I'm now going to paint around. And you can see the other drawings of the small buildings. There's very, very similar paintings, but we're going to treat them all quite differently. So I'm going to mix up some uh, blue and some raw sienna and no I'm not sorry um, I've decided to put the hills in the background so that's just some permanent alizarin crimson and some cobalt blue the cobalt blue is the 290 in Holbein so keep the top of those hills quite soft you don't want a very hard edged line so into my raw sienna, I've put some of the cloud mix and that will go quite a dark green. <clears throat> and because we're using or I'm using the same colors, repeating the color mix, it will, all, all the colors will go together. There won't be any jarring changes. So the colors always look well if you stick to using the same yellow, the same blue and the same red. You wouldn't sort of throw in a viridian green or anything at this stage, otherwise it would be too jarring. So I'm just drying <clears throat> off the brush a little bit and watching what that pigment does. Dropping in some more dark pigment and that will flow down to the edge of the dry paper. Sometimes your, your darks do need restating, otherwise they can dry very, very light. You just put a bit more dark in there and you can see that it's still flowing down the paper and the, the colours are mixing and merging together beautifully on the paper. Just defining a little bit of the buildings in the background. And now I've dried the tip of my brush, just softening up the top of those trees. <clears throat> we don't want them looking like they've been stamped onto the paper. Now with some really strong raw sienna, because the bottom edge of the paint was paper was dry, was quite wet, sorry, before, 
this will just flow on and those wet pigments will charge down the paper. I'm dropping in some burnt sienna because it's in the foreground and I want that to come forward and make the horizon recede. And you can see those lovely trails of pigment have flowed down the paper. They're still flowing down the paper so I'll put some more darks in. It's really a little bit too wet at this stage but it will be very soft when it dries. Just a little bit of splatter there for a bit of variation in the texture and the tone. Now that's dried now, so I'll just restate even more some of those darks. Cut in around the building, put a bit of, maybe there's some trees in the far distant background there. Some vegetation in the foreground. And maybe a little bit of a road or a pathway, or just a variation of sorts coming down there through the land. Flick some more splatter onto there, just for in the sake of interest. Oops, we've got some on this painting. Don't want that there. Okay, so you've got those beautiful streaks coming down in, the, in that sky and flowing into the trees almost. And you can see how the sky has merged with those far distant hills and it's all lovely and soft. I'll just put some shadow there under the roof line. Maybe there's some posts or poles, power poles or something in the background. And you need tonal variation. So you can see in that um, vegetation in front of the buildings, you, I've got light and dark. Maybe there's some sticks there, some posts or something. Make them a little bit darker as they come towards us. And with my rigger brush, just putting some fine lines there for the posts. Yeah, even a bit more tonal value there. Okay, so on to the second sky. So the first one you can see is quite a moody sky, very dark, dull, pouring with rain type of day. This one is going to be a sunny sky. So blue sky with some woolly clouds. So I'm painting this in exactly the same way. I'm lifting out and some of the pigment as it's flowing down the paper because I want these clouds to be very soft and have soft edges going into that patch of blue sky. So if I decide to add some more pigment, I don't know if you can see the shine on the paper there, but that paper is still shiny wet. That's really the only time you can add pigment to the paper if it's shiny wet or very dry. If it's damp and the shine goes off the paper, you'll end up with the most horrible sky. You'll get cauliflowers, we don't want them. So as long as that paper is shiny wet, you can keep adding as much pigment as you want in any colour that you want to put into your painting. Should it start to dry out, get your little mister bottle and just spray from a distance. Don't spray up close, spray from a distance and keep your paper with that bit of a shine on it and the paints will always merge and have a seamless effect. So there I'm just dropping in a bit more blue sky. It's peeping through from under that cloud. And you can see the shine on the paper there. So it's perfect for putting in more colour, more pigment, or just for dragging that cloudy haze down to the horizon and cutting in around the buildings, the vegetation again. So that cloud is very, very soft. 
if you want to lift out. I dry my brush and use it, really push that ferrule, which is the part that the hairs join to the shaft of the brush, really use it on its side and lift out that paint. If it's not lifting off, you've missed the opportunity to lift it out while the paper was still wet. It needs to be fairly damp, otherwise you can't lift it up with your brush. A clean brush that's been rinsed dry and I should be able to lift off some of that pigment. Now another trick you can do is get a piece of kitchen paper and fold it up, just dampen it slightly in your water. Wring it out really, really well. If it's not wrung out, you'll end up flooding your sky. And use it just like an eraser. And you can actually lift out some of that. And because it's damp and your paper's still damp, it will lift off the pigment. You can just see it's just a little bit lighter than when I lifted it off with my brush. Don't have the kitchen paper wet or it'll flood the paper and don't have it really dry otherwise you'll get sharp edges on your clouds which you can have but I didn't want them for this particular painting and while that edge of the sky is still damp I'm doing what I did before dropping in a mix of the phthalo blue the indigo and some burnt sienna and I've put a little bit of cobalt blue into this as well. Because it's a sunny day, I don't want such dark grey vegetation. And the top edge of the vegetation is lo lovely and soft. So just picking up a little bit more pigment. And dropping in to the trees. Cut in around the buildings. If you've got a long haired brush like the ones I use, you can just squeeze them into quite a sharp point. All good paint brushes need a good point if you want to paint fine areas like this. This is um, a Chinese or Japanese calligraphy brush and I love them because you can paint and paint and paint and the paint still keeps coming. It holds a lot of water and pigment, brilliant brush. Um, so over here, yeah, a little bit of raw sienna mixed in with that will give me a nice greenish colour and the paint is still flowing down into that vegetation and I'll just now that that sky is still working it's not completely dry I can drop in the far distant hills Okay, so now for some more pigment into that vegetation in the foreground. So again, using the side of my brush, I can just drag that down. And you can see that this is kind of painting itself, really, because I'm not doing anything really at all to sculpt that vegetation. It's flowing down, and it's really painting itself on the paper. So if you can use strong, clean brush strokes, it will happen. If you keep going over and over what you've painted, you won't see the variations in the pigment and the colours. The colours will all just merge and they'll go flat and look rather lifeless. 
So I'm just masking this out so I can do a little bit of splatter there with a sheet of paper and the core flute on the left is what I always use to stick my paper to when I'm going to paint. It's like a plastic cardboard and it's really light and very rigid. It's fantastic. So I'm just going in back now. I've zoomed in a bit closer and I'm just restating the darks on my buildings. Um, you can see how the vegetation there has formed without me doing really anything. I have lifted out, I just scratched some posts in there with a fingernail down in the central foreground and in the far distant trees. So I'm just going to do a bit of what I call Morse code across there. It could be darks behind a fence, it could be anything really. It's just for a bit of interest. It's just some random marks, some power poles in the distance. The brush I've swapped to now is a rigger brush. It has beautiful, long, very, very fine points. So I can get the most fantastic fine lines with those. Just a bit of variation there. Maybe it's a bit of a path like the previous one in the background. Just restate the darks, a bit of shadow there on those poles. Maybe there's some fencing wire or something like that. This is really fun to do. You can just put in whatever you like. And don't have any restrictions on yourself, just play around. So this is a quarter sheet of paper that I've used and I've put um, three sections, divided into three sections. I've taped down the edges with masking tape, but in the centre to mask off the three sections I've used magic tape. So you can't see that. It will look great when it's um, lifted off. Sorry, this is a close-up of my hair, not what you want to see. The camera's on auto, so it's focused on that instead of the painting. It'll go back in a moment. Okay, so there we go. We've got the two first paintings finished. Now this one I'm going to paint a, um, a sky, sunset or sunrise, with some warmth in the sky. So I'm putting raw sienna over the whole sky, but fading it right out as it reaches the horizon line. So it's great to practice skies like this until you can do it with confidence. Now over the top, I'm putting some permanent alizarin crimson. Make sure if you're buying alizarin crimson that it is permanent, otherwise it can fade it may not be permanent for as long as you want unless you buy permanent alizarin crimson. And that's the same whether you're buying watercolours, oils or acrylics. Make sure it's permanent. Just mopping off that leading edge. Okay, now you can see how wet that sky is and I've decided that it's a bit pale. It's not, when that's dry, watercolours dry about 10 to 20% lighter it's probably going to be paler than what I would like, so I'm going to go over that with some blue. And I always like to put the warm colours down first. For some strange reason, if you put the cool colours down first, it, it doesn't have the same effect. You can't ever get that warmth into your sky. Whereas if you put warm colours down first, they seem to... I don't know, get in first and they sit there. So that's just flowing nicely down the paper. Just mop off those great big runs because I've gone over the house. Okay, just that's very, very wet. I'm just smoothing that out. And I'm going to pick that up and just roll it around on the paper so that 
it's a little bit more combined than what it was. Because of the angle of the paper, you can get some things happening that you don't want. Where that tape is at the edge of your board, just be careful. You can get drops of water forming there that, you, um, that you're not suspecting. And when you turn your paper up the right way, they run down the sky, which is drying. And you can get horrible cauliflowers from that. So just keep an eye on that. There is so much to look out for when you're painting. So I've gone over the roof line there, so I'm just lifting that off. Now I've decided to put some purpley toned vegetation in there because I've used these colours previously to make the warm sky early morning, late afternoon, and just cutting in around the buildings leaving some, could be a water tower, could be some sheds in the background. And also the hill will be in the same colour. And I can drop a little bit of blue into that. <clears throat> this is the cobalt blue. And soften the top. Now the colours I've used here today are raw sienna, burnt sienna, cobalt blue 290, uh, some indigo and some phthalo blue. So I'm just dropping in some darker tones into that vegetation. Thought it was a little bit too purple. Just rinsing and drying the brush and just softening that top edge of the trees. Again, you don't want those trees to look like they've been stamped on the paper. And because the paint it's still wet on the paper, that's still shiny wet. I can come along and I can drop any colour I like in there. I can make it more green, more blue, anything, it doesn't matter. And it will merge beautifully because it's still wet. Just put some more detail there on the buildings. Just mess them up a little bit, like the old saying, same, same, but different. You don't want everything the same. It's always good to have some off-balance things in your paintings. I think if you've got lots of warm colours, then you need some cool, but never equal proportions. If I've got, say, a painting that's two-thirds light, I like to have a third that's dark. If I've got two-thirds cool colour, I like to put some warm, one-third warm in. Now I've decided, I think I'll go over that a little bit. That's better. I like that better. And this is, um, I'm using here Saunders Waterford paper. 300 gram and it's rough rough paper you can see how when I take my brush quickly across the paper you get those sparkles in the landscape if you want your paint to be lighter just put the tip of your brush in water and when you put it back on the paper it will be wet the paint will be lighter and the row of paint or the painted surface above will flow down Paint will only go where you've got wet paper. It won't merge into dry paper. The paper has to be wet. You can still see a little bit of the bluey purple um, in that vegetation, which can replicate the cool of the evening or the cool of the morning. And by going back in there with some more pigment, I can get the look of Maybe there's some shrubbery in that open paddock. 
just using again the side of my brush. The paint on the brush now is not that wet. It's quite strong pigment and not too wet, not too dry. You might want to practice these exercises on small scraps of paper before you launch into a full quarter sheet or half sheet painting, um, just to sort of find out what works best for you. Everybody's hand-eye coordination is different, so what works really well for one artist, another artist finds a real struggle and can probably find a better method to use to do it. So using my rigger brush again, I've just put some tree trunks in there, some marks in under those shrubs. Very fine lines, just adding to the interest in the paper and the painting. So light and dark, and you always need warm and cool. So just some calligraphy, maybe there's something there. Some posts in the background, pole. And the vegetation in the foreground, now it's drying a bit. I'll just use a fingernail to um, scrape out some extra lights for a bit more life and work. Terrible for your fingernails, you end up with dreadful black nails, but it does add a bit of magic to the painting. Okay, so yes, down the foreground you can see that that vegetation has filtered down at the paper and it's got that blue look to it. That's the cobalt that's done that. Beautiful colour for vegetation. So that paper on the previous painting is now dry enough to paint over. So I think I'll do a tree in there. So just with my trusty rigger brush, just a big mark straight down. If you love trees, like I do, study them and see how their branches form, how they come off the side of the tree. What's the difference between an Australian gum tree and a pine tree? And what is it that makes a particular tree easily identifiable as the tree that you're painting? Australian gum trees always have bits of black or very, very dark bark on them because there's usually been a fire at some stage. And they have a kind of a yellowy grey colour for their foliage. And it's usually very open and sparse. It's not terribly dense. So here I'm using uh, some dark colour left over from the background vegetation before. So the blues and greens that I've used before and I've added more raw sienna to it. It's quite a thick mix. So if you use the side of your brush you'll be able to get some really interesting I think and quite convincing look of foliage in your trees because it's still wet. I've added the dense foliage or the shadowed areas are always a little bit darker and you don't really have to do much more to the trees except put some maybe more twiggy branches that's a bit thick for up there so I'll just strengthen that trunk add some more twigs down there connect those little pieces up with some twigs yeah. and maybe put a dead stick out into the air something for the birds to perch on so you can see the difference now between the two the one with the tree has got more interest so I think let's put a tree into this one as well
So take your brush quite quickly down that rough paper and you can see the edges of the trunk are quite rough. So here I'm just <clears throat> finishing off that tree. Again I've used uh, quite a strong mix of pigment on the side on dry paper. And just connecting in some little twigs. With the trunk of the tree, this one I dropped some water in, just plain water right up the very top under that foliage and let it just work its way down the paper. It's added some interest, it's given variation in the tones of the tree trunk. Just connecting that up, making it look a little bit more dense with a damp brush. Just working out what else I need to do. Maybe some birds. A couple of birds in the sky. Okay, so now here we have the three different skies used in different ways for three different landscapes. We've got the stormy sky with the rain pouring down, a sunny sky, and then we've got an early morning or a late evening sky. Thanks very much for watching.